before we kick it over to uh, the team. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can put them in the Q&A throughout. We have enabled the upvote feature. So if you see a question that you absolutely want to make sure gets asked, you can go ahead and hit that little thumbs up sign on the Q&A and that will upvote it. Uh, and we'll make sure to try to get to those first. Uh, we'll be answering throughout and at the end. Um, you can also use the chat to talk to your fellow attendees or the moderator myself. Um, but we do want to make sure the questions get in the Q&A. Please note that everyone can see the chat, so be respectful to your fellow attendees and use the chat to share information and ideas regarding the presentation material. If you require closed captioning, uh, we have enabled that now, and you would hit your live transcript button on your Zoom and then hit show subtitle. Uh, so you can add uh, your own captioning if you would like to have it. So now I'm going to pass it over to Megan Killian, the Executive Vice President of NAEA, to get us started today. Welcome, Meg. Thanks, Erin. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today for our quarterly government relations webinar. We are so pleased to be able to provide these to you to give you updates on what's going on uh, in D.C. and on the Hill. Um, we're certainly coming off a very exciting time for uh for US Congress and the election and uh, excited to hear what that and Michelle have to say about how that's gonna impact Congress, how that's gonna impact our priorities as an organization um, and what's, what's next for the IRS as well as other things that we're watching. Um, before I kick it over to them, I just wanna make a quick note. Um, we know that a lot of our members are having a really hard time with the uh, priority Practitioner Priority Service, uh, and I will just want to acknowledge that we hear you. We know what's going on. We've been talking to uh, various IRS representatives on solutions and timelines, and so I just want everyone to be aware that we are working as hard as we can to make sure that this stays front of mind, stays a priority for them, and that we get some some alleviation to some of the issues in, very soon. So. Um, so just know that we are definitely aware of it and working on your behalf to, to get some results. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to uh, introduce Dad and Michelle who are gonna talk about the midterm results and, and what's next. Great. Thanks, Meg, appreciate it. Good morning. Um, we mentioned this briefly a moment ago and since we're getting the group growing, I can see on the, on the screen. Um, I want everyone to know that we will be having a fly-in. Here's your official notice. May 23 and 24 of 2023. Dad and I are so excited. We've been working on putting a, together a program. It'll be a two-day event this time. The first day will be um, speakers and panel discussions throughout the day. And then the second day will be the meetings on Capitol Hill. So um, mark calendars, we'll be sending out an official save the date soon, but lots of people have been asking, so I wanted you to know that we haven't forgotten, it's in the works, May 23 and 24. Great, thanks, Michelle. And I feel like everyone that's on this webinar should be sort of like our number one target to come for the fly-in, uh, because there's gonna be lots of good policy, good politics and good discussion. So hope all of you um, can make it. And I think May will be a, a nice time in DC, a, a good time of good time of year to be here. Uh, so we're excited for it. Um, and we're excited for today. Obviously, lots going on the last couple of weeks with the elections and sort of the aftermath of the elections. And in some places, they're still counting the votes. Um, I saw when you guys were saying where you're from, the first thing that came to my mind was lots of states that had big uh, political races, whether it was Colorado, um, uh, California, North Carolina, a number of states um, were very active uh, this year on the political front. And so excited to kind of dive into what happened in the midterms and, and, and what the impacts will be um, moving forward. Uh, so Michelle and I are gonna uh, tag team a little bit. If you have questions, go ahead and ask them because Michelle is gonna be monitoring um, the questions and can ask them as we go. We don't have to wait till the end. We will save some time for the end, um, but we can ask, ask them as we go and make this a little more uh, conversational. Um, 
but let's go ahead and, and get started. Let's see. There we go. Sorry. It was working very well before, <laughs> before right before we started. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the midterms and some of the surprises we saw about where things stand today. We're going to walk through some of the individual Senate races. We did this in the pre-election webinar we had where we talked about some of the hot races. So we'll, we'll talk about how some of those um, ended up and what happened with the House. And then moving forward, we've got the, um, the lame duck uh, session of Congress uh, for folks. I think most folks know this, but for folks that don't, they call the lame duck the period between uh, the election and when the next Congress gets sworn in. Uh, so you have you know senators and congressmen in office that will be leaving soon and the new folks haven't come in. And it's that period where they try to get a lot of stuff done before the end of the year. And they've got a lot of stuff on the table this year. Um, the IRS, some new developments there, including a, a, a new acting commissioner and a, a new nominee. And so we'll go into that. And then we'll talk briefly about what all this means for, um, for next year. Uh, so the midterm surprise. So, you know, there's been lots of talk the last um, few months about a red wave, a potential red wave. Uh, there were times that looked more likely than others. But as we approach the election, I think most of the media, most of the political prognosticators kind of bought into this idea that Democrats um, were in trouble and, um, and that Republicans were going to win big. Uh, a few of the headlines here, um, the one in the top left, confidence, anxiety, and a scramble for votes two days before the midterm. Um, going to be ugly, all signs point to Republican landslide in Florida. Um, the, the battle for the Senate, the real clear politics projection, you'll see on the bottom left, they had predicted 40, 54 Republican seats in the Senate and 46 Democratic seats. And then I was looking around for quotes yesterday, and this one uh, struck me that was in Axios. It said, Republican leaders in the House and Senate are already clamoring for credit in anticipation of ga gaining seats in Tuesday night's midterms with several eyeing a potential GOP wave as a launch pad for their own political ambitions. Uh, that was the day before, um, before the elections. And as uh, most folks know from watching the news, the way things turned out, it was really more of a red ripple uh, than a wave. Um, uh, Republicans did gain seats in the, um, in the House, and it looks like they will take the majority, which is a big deal but they didn't nearly meet the expectations that were out there. And then the, um, with the Senate, um, the Dems, Democrats will hold the Senate. Um, and so um, kind of what happened with that, and a few of the headlines here on the right, Sunday shows preview expected red wave falls short in midterms. Democrats will keep control of the Senate, NBC News projects. And so, um, I think everyone sort of on both sides of the aisle and, and in the media are kind of saying, all right, what happened here? How did um, a lot of folks get this wrong? And, and what was sort of the motivation behind these outcomes in the election? And uh, just to walk through a few, if you look at um, how states turned out, and this is especially true in the Senate, it's, it's true in a lot of states in the House as well, um, really, Trump states went Republican and Biden states uh, went Democratic. And, uh, and we'll get into some states like Pennsylvania and you know, Nevada and how they turned out. Um, there was a strong voter turnout. 46.9% uh, of eligible voters voted in the midterm. That's not the highest. It was down a little bit, which was around 50% in 2018. Um, but it's much higher than sort of traditional midterm turnout, which is normally a lot lower. Um, and there were some um, pockets of really strong Republican strength, uh, one being Florida. Um, as folks, um, uh, Governor DeSantis has been getting a lot of attention there, um, but they also had some big uh, congressional pickups. Part of that was the redistricting of the congressional map. Um, and then even New York, um, Kathy Hochul, the Democratic nominee uh, and current governor did win uh, in New York, but a lot of the House seats, especially um, around 
um, around New York City, Long Island, and, and, and areas like that, ended up flipping uh, to Republican. Um, a lot of people think of New York as a traditional Democratic state, um, but Republicans made some real inroads there. Um, but then you had other states like Michigan and Pennsylvania that showed incredible democratic strength where you had governors win by wide margins and you had um, uh, strong um, congressional races as well. Uh, if you look at who won, you know, what's interesting is a lot of times midterm elections are quote unquote change elections where it's kind of throw the bums out, let's get some new fresh blood. Um, this really was not a change election. Um, incumbents did really well. Um, you did not have um, a lot of, you know, seats flipping on either side of the aisle. Um, and if you look at the polling, you know, there's all this talk about, you know, how did the polls get it so wrong? The mainstream polls, sort of the independent polls that, you know, are put out by universities and, and news organizations, they largely got it right. Um, they're, um, there were polls that were more partisan that are sometimes factored in, like we saw on the first page, the Real Clear Politics, saying that Republicans would win 54 seats. That factored in a lot of um, partisan polls that are done by campaigns uh, that skew the numbers a little bit. But most of the independent polls um, largely got it right. And then there was this idea of decoupling. One of the reasons, probably the main reason that people thought Democrats were going to lose bigger in this election is because of the historic trend of midterm elections when it's the first, first term for a president, they normally lose big. Um, but then also Biden's poll numbers were you know, around 44%, and that normally does not bode well for the incumbent party. Um, but a lot of voters um, you know, did what, what, what they're calling decoupling, which was say, you know, I might not be thrilled with Biden's approval rating, um, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to, you know, throw out all the incumbent Democrats um, because of other factors, uh, which we'll talk about um, in terms of what was motivating, motivating these voters. Um, I'll move on to the next slide. But, Michelle, I don't I want to sort of see if you have any either any thoughts or questions you wanted to share before I do that. No questions yet. Um, I think the 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 um, the polling was. Um, unusual this time, but with a with a very uh, evenly divided voter base and really par deeply polarized people, it's not really surprising that it turned out the way it, it did. Um, elections of 10 years ago are not anything we're going to see again anytime soon. I think the, the voters have, have completely changed and it'll be it'll be a rough ride going forward, I think, for quite a while. Yep. And I think part of that part of that divisiveness is this Trump effect. And um, and, you know, Trump, even though he was not on the ballot, even though he was not in the White House, was sort of uh, on both sides of the aisle, sort of a big presence in this election. And um, when you look at, you know, there's lots of um, sort of Monday, Monday night quarterbacking or Monday morning quarter. Um, uh, handicapping about <laughs> or quarterbacking about who you know who's at fault on the Republican side for how things turned out and and you know I won't I won't um, get into calling winners and losers there but some of the things that have been raised are around um, some of the endorsements that Trump made so a lot of the candidates he endorsed um, were first-time candidates that had not run for political office. Um, we saw Dr. Oz from Pennsylvania, who I'm sure everybody heard about this election cycle and knows from his Oprah days and TV days, um, was um, Trump's uh, endorsement in Pennsylvania. Um, he kind of had a rocky road from the beginning because he was an inexperienced candidate. Uh, he had lived in New Jersey. He kind of moved to Pennsylvania for the race. Um, he obviously had a lot of money, but also was, was somewhat controversial. There were similar type situations, both in governor's races and Senate races around the country, where um, Trump kind of picked the renegade and not necessarily the experienced candidate, which, which you know, might have hurt Republicans. Um, the sort of reminder of, of election denials, of, of sort of saying the 2020 race was not legitimate, 
the January 6th as well um, was still on voters' minds. I think the polls um, or the, the voting results bared that out. And then um, Trump also really discouraged early voting and mail-in ballots. That was kind of a carryover from 2020 saying Republicans should not trust early voting. Um, in the meantime, Democrats really did an effective job of getting their voters out early. And so they had big, big leads in a lot of these races going into election day because they had gotten so many voters um, out early. Um, Trump was also teasing a 2024 presidential announcement, which we, you know, ended up happening yesterday. Um, and also, and this was more so in the House, attacking some, some of his GOP opponents. So these were folks that were um, moderate Republicans that had maybe voted for impeachment or had been against uh, Trump in other, um, other ways. And he either supported their opponent in the primary, um, which turned out uh, ended up with the Democrat winning the, the general election, or just sort of spoke unfavorably about some of these candidates. So I think that kind of weighed down on, the, um, on a lot of the um, Republican candidates. And then on the issues, obviously lots of big issues, um, but I'll go through a few here. One, the abortion issue, the Roe v. Wade um, decision uh, being overturned by the Supreme Court. Um, you know, there was some talk about did that happen too early for Democrats to really benefit from it? You know, it was a big story over the summer. Did it kind of die down before the elections? I think voter behavior and exit polls and stuff showed that this remained a large issue for voters through the election. A lot of, um, a lot of voters were fired up about this and, and it did drive that turnout to the polls, especially on the Democratic side. Um, and then economy and inflation, that is really what Republicans, you know, in some states, crime, which we'll get to in a second, but economy and the inflation was kind of the main, um, you know, platform that Republicans were running on. And, um, and Democrats were at a disadvantage on that issue. They did lose some support, um, but it turned out that in a lot of these states, it was not fatal. It was not such an overriding issue um, that folks sort of took on that, throw the bums out, let's, you know, replace all the incumbents. Um, crime, uh, especially the last couple of months, emerged as a major issue. In a few states, I'll mention New York, because this it was really evident here, you know, um, because of state law, abortion was not as immediately on the, on the ballot in New York or as much of a concern, but uh, crime is something that, that um, you know, the state and especially New York City has been struggling with the last couple of years. Republicans really position this as, a, as one of the key issues. And I think it's one of the reasons they picked up seats um, in New York. Um, and then just the idea, and this kind of goes back to the Trump thing too, voters were really seeking stability and status quo. They, um, they were not, um, you know, this was not that change election that we've seen in, in other elections. Um, so before I, I was in a, well, this gets into sort of where things stand now and they're counting votes every day. So I'll sort of um, update where this exactly is right now. But uh, Michelle, anything to add before I get into this? Nothing yet, keep going, you're doing well. Okay, so. <laughs> So for the House, and I was looking for an updated chart because this one is, you know, a day and a half old and, and, and things are changing so fast. Um, but um, the projection is that Republicans will win the House. If you look at um, sort of how things shook out over the weekend and the last couple of days, um, the projection we've got on the, on the bottom is 220 GOP seats, 215. That 220 could climb to you know, maybe 221, 222. But just to remind folks, um, a party needs 218 seats uh, to have the majority. And so um, this is a very narrow, narrow uh, majority that Republicans are likely to have. Um, they, um, you know, McCarthy will only be able to lose one or two votes. Um, and still be able to pass legislation if he becomes the speaker. Also becoming speaker, which we'll get into a, a little later, becomes a lot harder because he does need 218 votes uh, to become speaker. 
And so right now, I think this 212 number on the top chart has ticked up a little bit, um, but Republicans are kind of knocking on that door of 217, 218. Um, I think even some new or news organizations might have said that they've got the 218 they need for the majority, uh, but most, um, most organizations are saying they've got around 217. But top line story, a very evenly divided House. Republicans um, will have the majority, it looks like. Democrats will be out, um, but it's going to be much narrower than was initially expected. And then in the Senate, as, as folks know, we've been in a 50-50 Senate. Kamala Harris broke the tie for the Democrats. So we've had um, uh, Chuck Schumer as the majority leader in the Senate. But because it's 50-50, um, you know, when it comes to committee votes, committees are evenly divided. Um, when it comes to moving nominees out of committee, moving legislation, subpoena power, um, it's, it's been really even. And then if there's a big vote sort of in Congress, Kamala Harris um, breaks that tie. Um, after some of the Senate races, um, you know, um, were called this weekend, Repu uh, Democrats did hit the 50 senators to maintain their majority. That's without the runoff in Georgia. So if Democrats win the runoff in Georgia, they could have 51 seats. Um, but at the very least, they'll maintain the 50-50 and, um, and, and have status quo from what we've had the last two years. So I wanted to walk through a, a few of these Senate races and folks have probably you know, seen some of them on national news or followed some of them and then you might be from some of these states. Um, but Herschel Walker of, of football um, fame was the Republican nominee in Georgia, was endorsed early on by President Trump um, against uh, Raphael Warnock, who was elected in a special election two years ago. And then they had the, he had the runoff that was in January uh, two years ago that decided the control of the um, United States Senate, which, which gave Democrats uh, the ex, you know, there were two runoffs in Georgia, so it gave them the two <laughs> seats to hit 50. Um, in Georgia, if you don't hit 50%, you have a runoff. And so, as you can see from the numbers, Warnock was at 49.41%, Walker was at 48.52%. It's heading to a runoff on December 6th. Um, if, if Republicans had won one more seat, it would have all been about this runoff and who wins it for who has control. Um, but because Democrats hit 50, this becomes a little less important um, because it won't decide who controls um, uh, the Senate, but still extremely important um, because, as I said, when it comes to committee votes, when it comes to moving nominees, when it comes to having a little bit of breathing room, not having to have Kamala Harris come down to break votes, um, break tie votes, um, and, and also when you look at future years, what this means for both parties in terms of, 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 of continuing to seek the majority. Obviously, these are, this is a six year term. Um, he had a special election last time. So, so Senator Warnock had two years, but this is for a full six year term. And so you can't really um, you know, overestimate the importance of, of, of these seats to both parties. Um, Moving on to some of the other Senate races. So Arizona was a big one. Um, Mark Kelly um, came out on top. This was uh, another opponent that was endorsed early by um, President Trump, was, was a bit controversial, um, sort of was not your traditional, Blake Masters was not your traditional um, sort of Republican nominee for Senate. Uh, Mark Kelly um, has a, you know, a storied background was married, is married to Gabby Giffords, who was the Congresswoman from Arizona who was shot. Um, he was a former astronaut. His brother was also an astronaut. And so they're sort of famous as being the, uh, a duo there, um, but raised a ton of money. And Arizona has just become a state that's very, very divided. And uh, Mark Kelly, the Democratic incumbent won there. Another, you know, very close and exciting race was in Nevada, where Cortez Masto, uh, Catherine Cortez Masto, won re-election. Um, she got 48.8% of the vote against her opponent, Adam Laxalt. That was called on Saturday night. 
Um, the way the the voting works in, in Nevada is the mail-in votes, you can mail them up until election day, as long as it's postmarked on election day. And so uh, on election night, uh, Laxalt actually had a pretty healthy lead, um, but Cortez Masto, there were a lot of mail-in ballots from Cook County, which is Las Vegas, uh, that were coming in every day after that, that were heavily favor favoring her. And so she came back and uh, overtook the lead on Saturday and they called that race for her Saturday night, which is what put the Senate at the at the 50 um, 50 seat mark for Democrats. She's also on the Senate Finance Committee, which is one of our important committees and likely will be staying there and our PAC and the NAA PAC supported her during this election season. Yep, good point. And another another female senator who's also on Finance Committee that was also supported by the PAC is um, is Maggie Hassan of New Hampshire, uh, a uh, former governor, and um, this was for her second term. And um, this was a uh, another situation where Republicans, so John Sununu is the governor, very popular sort of storied political family in New Hampshire, and Republicans had hoped he would run. Um, he ended up um, not running and um, and Republicans nominated a Trump supporter um, who um, was a little more controversial. And Maggie Hassan was able to, um, to pull that out and win with 53.6% um, of the vote. And then I know everyone heard about uh, Pennsylvania because this was the race that was all over the place. Um, Pat Toomey, Republican Senator from, um, from Pennsylvania uh, is retiring. And so it was an open seat and it was um, John Fetterman, who's the current Lieutenant Governor um, running against Mehmet Oz, uh, Dr. Oz. And um, Oz, as I mentioned earlier, was endorsed by Trump, uh, was a, um, you know, sort of TV personality. Um, Fetterman has his own style. He wears very casual clothes, wears hoodies, has a lot of tattoos. He's six eight. He's really he's kind of a a plain spoken, um, you know, not doesn't look like your typical senator. Um, he did. I was asking someone. I said, "Do you think he'll wear a suit?" I mean, you have to wear a suit if you're a senator. And they said, "Well, he did put one on for the debate, so uh, so we think he'll do it." But when he's back home, he's not someone that's going to wear a suit. He's going to wear a sweat sweatshirt and and um, but he, uh, as, as a lot of, I'm sure folks saw, um, had a stroke a few months ago, which sort of, um, impacted his cognitive ability in the, in the short term or his ability to communicate. Um, they say he'll make a full recovery, but that became a big issue in the race. Um, it was a challenge in the, in the debate. Um, but another state that's, uh, you know, very divided. They also had a very strong, um, gubernatorial candidate in Pennsylvania, Josh Shapiro, uh, which I think helped Fetterman um, because Shapiro won big over his Republican opponent. Um, but um, Pennsylvania went uh, Democratic in, in a, a, a key state um, for both sides. Uh, two states where Republicans were able to hold on uh, that were really being targeted by Democrats. Um, another example, you know, more examples of sort of incumbent it being a, a year of the incumbent. Um, in Wisconsin, Ron Johnson. Um, Johnson is a former businessman, conservative Republican. Um, he always looks at threat for losing reelection because he is pretty conservative and, and Wisconsin is a, you know, a pretty purple state these days. Um, but he pulled it out. He, he has a tendency to be able to pull out these elections and he got 50.5% of the vote against Mandela Barnes. And then in North Carolina, um, this wasn't seen as competitive, although as you'll see, the, the vote was still very close, um, but Ted Budd uh, won his race against um, uh, Sherry Beasley. Um, he was a, uh, a Trump endorsed candidate as well, one that was able to, um, to pull out the win. So before I go on to the house races, and we're gonna talk a little later about sort of the the landscape of of the Senate and the Congress and what this means from a you know policy perspective moving forward. 
Um, but first, we'll just touch on some of the the, um, the house landscape. But before I move on, Michelle, any questions or anything you want to add? Uh, no questions yet. Keep. I All think right. we're, we're doing well. All right. Um, so for the house races, um, again, these numbers at the top might be a little out of date. They're kind of um, calling these races as they come. Because of mail-in voting, um, I mentioned this for Nevada, but uh, it's, we're seeing a lot of this in California too. Some of these races are just taking a lot more time to call um, because they're waiting for mail-in votes. They're counting those votes through a different process. And so that's why we still have sort of races that have not been called. Um, but it was a, you know, I sort of think of it in terms of the expectations game because winning majority of the House is a big deal. I mean, Republicans are gonna, you know, take over the leadership of the House. They will set the whole agenda. They will control the committee chairmanships. Um, winning the majority is a big deal. I think that the problem is they set the expectations too high. They kind of were saying, we're just gonna be a red wave, we're gonna win 25, 30 seats. And, um, and so when they are sort of like barely limping to the majority by just like one, two, three seats, um, you know, people comparing that to what they were predicting, 30 seats, and it's, it's sort of being viewed as a, as a real letdown or a real failure on the Republican side because they did not, you know, have that big mandate, but, I don't want it to get lost that it is a big deal that there's going to be a change of leadership, you know, with the Republicans taking over the House that will have serious implications from an oversight perspective, from a legislative perspective um, across the board. So, hey, Thad, we have a quick yep. question about yep. um, Senate finance. And okay. I know we don't know yet. We had four members on the Republican side who who retired or left the committee. So the the numbers, while the numbers uh, total number of members may remain the same, we're going to see a, a big change probably on the Republican side to replace those four members who who um, rolled off, retired. Yeah. So this time, so Senate Finance Committee and and it's similar to Ways and Means in the House. It's a very coveted committee. Um, it's sort of, if you can get on finance, that's a big deal. And, um, and so a lot of times you'll have incumbent senators sort of in line to get on finance. Um, and so, I mean, there are exceptions where you'll have a, a freshman member um, get on, but I think that uh, the more likely scenario is we have some, um, you know, incumbent senators move into those roles that aren't currently on finance. And um, and I it's still a little early. The the chairmanships. Well, we do know that Wyden is going to remain chairman, and Crapo. And I think I mentioned this later in the presentation. And, and Crapo is going to remain the ranking member. And so we're not going to have a change at the top, uh, like we will in the in with House Ways and Means. Um, but the membership will have some changes, and um, and that's still kind of shaking out. I can't tell you exactly who the who the new folks will be. Um, Sad. Yep. For the um, so, I thought this was interesting. So Dave Wasserman, he's with Cook Political Report, which is one of the one of the main um, publications that really handicaps and picks, you know, um, who they think's going to win the races and tracks all the polls and all of that. And if you look at how things turned out, it was pretty close to what they predicted for for the. For the solid Democratic, likely Democratic, and lean Democratic seats, they got all of those rights. Everyone they predicted to win won. Um, on the Republican side, um, that was pretty much the case as well. Although Washington three, which was a that was a seat where where Trump had targeted the incumbent who ended up the incumbent Republican who ended up losing the primary. Um, and then that person, even though it was a Republican seat, lost to the to the Democrat. Um, but it's that toss up. It's that toss up races where I think the difference was really made. Republicans were feeling really strong that they were going to win, you know, the majority of these toss up races. And that's where Democrats ended up outperforming 
um, Republicans and winning, you know, a good majority of, of, of the toss up races, um, which is how we ended up with such a narrow, you know, a narrow house. Um, because of redistricting in some states like New York and Florida and a few other places, um, even with a really good Democratic night, it was going to be really hard for them to hold the hold the majority. Um, so what does this mean for leadership? Um, they actually had a vote yesterday where Kevin McCarthy got, um, I think it was 180 something votes within his caucus and Andy Biggs, the challenger, got 31 I think it was, but but here's the reality, and it's kind of back to that expectations thing. McCarthy has been preparing to be speaker for a long time, and he's he's done a lot of things to kind of put him in a good position for that. Um, but because the results came in so narrow, because they had kind of hyped up that they were going to win big, and and they're and they're looks like they're going to barely win this. Um, there's a lot of um, frustrated folks in the House Republican caucus, especially on the conservative side that that weren't necessarily, you know, in love with Kevin McCarthy to start with. And so they're they're raising a lot of noise saying, hey, why are we just going to support you unless, you know, some real changes are made, some real concessions are made, unless you give us a lot of what we're asking for. The way it works in the House, it's interesting. The caucus had this vote yesterday just within the caucus, but then um, whoever wins that gets put forward to be speaker uh, on January 3rd um, on the House floor. And on the House floor, you have to get 218 votes to be speaker. And so let's say Republicans end up with 220, 221 Republicans. You're going to need 218 of those to vote for Kevin McCarthy for him to be speaker. And so what the Andy Biggs challenge did yesterday um, was show. He doesn't have that 218. And I think uh, he will bend over backwards and, and, and do whatever it takes to try to get to that 218. Um, but there's going to be a lot of Republican demands around, um, around, you know, changes to how things are run in the House, empowering members, how, um, you know, committee chairs are chosen. Uh, there's a the whole list of things that especially conservative Republicans are saying, hey, we need you to agree to all this stuff for us to vote for you. And then some folks are saying, we're not gonna vote for you regardless. And so this is gonna be very interesting to see how it plays out. I think a lot of people feel like there's probably not an alternative. There's no strong candidate. Like if it's not Kevin McCarthy, it'll be this person. And so, um, you know, either he'll cobble together the 218 and sort of, um, be able to become speaker, but probably it'll be a, a little bit weakened of a position because I'll have to give away a lot to get there or someone else or he'll fail and someone else will emerge, uh, which is probably less likely, but but something we will be watching, watching closely. Um, so um, lame duck session. So now we're gonna get into a little more of the policy stuff. I said at the beginning, lame duck session is basically now until Christmas, what can Congress get done before the end of the year, before the new Congress is um, is sworn in? And they've got a lot on their plate. Um, and here's the calendar, which is, you know, they're here this week. This week has really been consumed by these leadership discussions, people kind of digesting the results of the election. Um, and so not a ton of policy has happened this week. Um, a few things that we'll talk about. And then they're, they're, they're gone next week for Thanksgiving. Um, and then they're back and they've pretty much got until the 16th, although that could, could get extended when the appropriations package, um, when the appropriations package expires or the current appropriations um, expires and, uh, and they'll need to get something done by then. Um, you know, Christmas has always been a great motivator for Congress. Um, they tend to, when they're under pressure uh, to get something done, uh, they will normally cut a deal and get it done before Christmas so they can go home and be with their families. Um, 
And so I don't see this going beyond Christmas, but, but technically they could go up until, you know, up until January 2nd, if they needed to, to, to get everything done before the end of the year. And so a couple of dates, December 6th runoff in Georgia. Um, December 16th is when that stopgap funding measure uh, expires. A number of other things expire too. And so basically, you know, you either need a big appropriations bill, which we'll talk about, or a continuing resolution to keep the government running, um, or you have a government shutdown. And so those are kind of the three things that you got to get one of those done. Uh, you know, one of the two done by December 16th, or you have a government shutdown. Um, and then there's also stuff that's expiring at the end of the year that will kind of get lumped into the same sort of, you know, it's all kind of considered end of the year, but we, you've got some December 31st deadlines as well. Um, so appropriations. Um, funding the government kind of becomes the vehicle for the other stuff, you know? Uh, at NAEA, we're interested in the government funding because there is IRS funding and, and other stuff, um, but it's really more about it becomes a vehicle for, um, for other stuff to pass that we might be interested in. Um, and so, um, you know, the, where things stand right now is Republicans and Democrats have to agree on a top line number. So this is sort of like the, you know, the big number of how much the government's going to spend in FY23. Um, and they still have not decided on that number. And it's really hard for them to start negotiating until they know what they're going to spend. And so they are working on that this week. And um, I know the goal is to have a number before Thanksgiving so they can really start negotiating in earnest. Um, but if they're, if they're sort of stuck, we might even know as early as the end of this week uh, of where that stands. Um, but that would allow them to have a substantive sort of big appropriation spill as opposed to having to do a CR, which is just, hey, let's just kick the can down the road and, and, and keep it status quo. So some areas of interest around what could potentially be um, attached to a big CR packet, to a big um, appropriations package. Um, there's some, um, Secure 2.0 is the retirement legislation that I know we've talked about on some of the past webinars that would give new tax incentives to small businesses for starting a 401k plan um, and, um, and some other things like allowing businesses to, to match student loan payments uh, with the tax deduction contribute, uh, a tax-free contribution to the 401k, a number of other provisions that are really aimed around incentivizing small businesses to offer retirement plans. Um, that's a bipartisan bill, came out of Finance and Ways and Means Committee um, that could potentially be part of an end of the year package. There are a number of tax extenders. Um, the two we've heard the most about recently is the R&D, uh, same year expensing as part of tax reform a few years ago. Um, they said you would have to write it off over five years. That just kicked in this year. Um, there's support on both sides of the aisle to say, let's allow it expensed in one year. Um, and so there's a big um, push to get that um, uh, re-upped to where it would just be one year. And then there's the child tax credit. This is more of a democratic priority right now. Remember under COVID, they really enhanced those child tax credits. They did the monthly payments. Um, that got scaled back at the end of, I think it was the end of last year um, to $2,000. Democrats would like to double that. I think that's probably unrealistic because um, there's not a lot of Republican support for doubling that. But as they negotiate some of this stuff, um, I think a scaled back version of the child tax credit increase could happen uh, as Republicans are looking to get some of their stuff through. Um, and then two others I just wanted to mention, sort of similar to the R&D, but a little different. One is renewing bonus depreciation, um, which would allow equipment purchases to be uh, written off in a single year. Um, that has expired and, and a number of folks would like to see that re-upped. And then also 
uh, reinstating a more generous deduction for interest expense write-offs um, that expired at the end of 2021. Um, and so you could potentially see a situation where um, some of these, you know, write-off extensions Republicans really want, the child tax credit, uh, some of the more progressive Democrats are really pushing, they might come to a deal where they, where they um, you know, agree to all that. And there's other tax extenders too, just sort of routine things that have to be extended every few years. Um, and then I threw the Safe Banking Act in there. That's the cannabis legislation, which basically says banks, sort of national banks can, you know, um, handle money from cannabis businesses, you know, assuming it's legal in that state. Uh, so right now, you know, because uh, federal law does not um, allow for marijuana, uh, banks are kind of at risk from a regulatory standpoint um, if they work across, you know, across state lines. And so this would provide some protection. And there's a chance that this could be in the mix for the end of the year as well. Okay, so so that, let me ask you a quick question that just you. came in about CTC. Yep. Um, Senator Rubio and, and, and others have said that they are for increasing it, but they keep voting against it. Um, is this just because the bills have D's on them? Well, no, it's a good question. So the, you know, Senator Romney was another person who really, um, who really pushed to have a stronger child tax credit, uh, because it does show that it, it dramatically can decrease um, poverty. And so this is not just a democratic idea, they're Republican ideas um, as well, although I think it's it's more of a few, a few members. A, a couple of things, I'm not sure exactly, I don't wanna say exactly why Rubio has voted against it, but I know that um, a couple of factors one has been around work requirements or other requirements around recipients. And so uh, folks don't want this to be sort of seen as welfare or sort of like a, a, a free lunch, you know? And so there've been details around, all right, what requirements do you put with this money um, where we aren't just giving it to anyone or everyone? And so that, that could be part of it. And then I know that the, the whole inflation, you know, conversation around, does this, I mean, I think it's statistically proven that this does slightly impact inflation because you are giving out more money. Um, and so whether that's, you know, that has been part of the discussion as well. I know with Senator Manchin, um, when they were looking at doing the inflation, sort of the bill before the Inflation Reduction Act, when they were talking about a bigger package, Senator Manchin was not in favor of the CTC because of some of the inflation concerns. Thanks, Matt. Yep. So this one's interesting, and this one might not happen. I got sort of an, a, a little bit of an update on that this morning, but the debt ceiling. So um, sometime in, or it looks like the third quarter of 2022, 23, they're predicting that we're going to reach the debt ceiling again. Um, that's obviously the borrowing authority of the United States government. We pretty much have, have to increase it or we would default on our obligations and it would be you know, devastating to the economy. Um, a number of conservative Republicans have sort of said, we should really use this as leverage to sort of get a pound of flesh and get our way because they know that no one's gonna let, let us default, the government default on our obligations. And so the question has been, what do we get in return, what can we hold hostage and kind of, um, you know, milk this uh, for some real policy changes? And so uh, Nancy Pelosi and some other Democrats have said, well, let's take care of this before January 3rd when Republicans come into the House. Let's take this issue off the table so we don't have to deal with that, you know, in 2023. And in order to do that, they'd really have to use reconciliation which would allow them to pass this with 50, 51 votes in the, um, in the Senate. Um, and so um, there has been talk about, could they get that done during the lame duck? Pelosi said recently that she would like to, that she'd like to um, at least consider doing this and move forward with it. Um, I think uh, 
what I heard this morning was that Manchin had said he really didn't want to do this unless it was bipartisan. And so they need every Democratic vote if they're going to do it in the Senate. And then I think McConnell said he didn't want to do it. So that means it probably won't be bipartisan. <laughs> and so I don't know if this is, you know, and then there's the timing issue. This takes a lot of time because they have to go through this process called Votorama. And there are these different steps, part of the reconciliation process that you remember from some of the past bills like the Inflation Reduction Act. And so um, not sure if this is gonna happen, but it, it could become an issue in the next you know, six weeks as they look to take this, um, this potential problem next year off the table. So here's a question. Yep. If, the, if the House tries to hold the debt ceiling hostage, then doesn't it just get dumped on McCarthy and the Republicans to have to deal with it? Um, that would allow the Democrats to hold the Republicans hostage, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, that's the, then you get into the blame game, but kind of like a shutdown. You never know who's going to actually end up taking the blame. Um, it's um, It would be a negotiation between the House, the Senate, and and the White House, obviously. And um, and so similar to like when you're looking at a potential shutdown, you know, it's risky because if if Biden or someone said, oh, we'll just let, you know, McCarthy take the blame. Well, then if the economy crashes, people might blame the president, in the, you know, in the White House or vice versa, like we saw with the shutdown in, in 94, uh, Newt Gingrich ended up really taking the blame because people thought he was being unreasonable. Um, and so it, it, that has gone both ways, but it's risky. But I'll tell you one thing, Wall Street, big corporations, they do not want this to become an issue because it would really spook the markets and, um, and you know, not be good for the economy. Now um, to the exciting part. Yes, now to the exciting part. Let me look at the time. Oh, it's 52 after, so I'll, we don't have a ton of time. Um, so I'm sure everyone saw, or, or, or most people saw, that on Thursday afternoon, um, the uh, the president finally nominated an IRS commissioner, um, Danny Werfel. He um, was an appointee under Obama at the Office of Management and Budget. He was the controller for the U.S., so has lots of experience um, in dealing with big budgets. Um, has became the acting IRS commissioner when there were some of the issues around nonprofits under Obama. He kind of came in to, to sort of help clean things up and, and, and be there during a transition period. And I think he got, you know, relatively strong marks for that. And then has since been with the Boston Consulting Group um, where um, he's worked on large IT and kind of public, um, public agency type issues, workforce issues as well. And so um, beyond that, I don't know a ton about him. I, I think he's, you know, fairly well regarded. Um, but he is the nominee. I don't expect him to be super controversial in times of the in terms of the timing. So I think if Republicans, this is what we're hearing sort of directly from the Finance Committee. If Republicans had won the Senate, this would have been definitely rushed through or tried to be rushed through before the end of the year because of concerns that Republicans would hold this up if they were in charge. Um, of course, a nominee just has to be confirmed by the Senate. It doesn't go through the House. Um, now that the Senate um, is going to remain Democratic, uh, we're sensing that there's a little less urgency, that they're still saying this is their top priority, but they're feeling like, well, if we do it in January or February, it won't be the end of the world. There are folks in the IRS world, um, including the former, a lot of former commissioners um, like uh, Charles Rosati and um, Fred Goldberg and John Koskinen have come out with a statement, um, came out with a statement on Monday that said, you need to confirm this guy as quickly as possible because you've got this $80 billion that has been, you know, given to IRS. They're working on a strategic plan, which is due to Treasury um, in the middle of February. And there's, it's really hard to prioritize and sort of move that forward if you don't have a, a, a Senate confirmed political leader. Uh, Doug O'Donnell's the acting over there, which I'll go to. He's a lot of people respect him, but he's a career IRS guy. He's not gonna make the really sort of tough calls that 
um, someone chosen by the president to come in and the Senate confirmed would make. And so we'll see how that shakes out. I don't have a ton of faith in the Senate for moving quickly, um, but I think there's you know some chance that this that that Werfel gets some movement this year. And um, but if he's not confirmed this year, it'll go into next year. And I think, uh, he, I think he's an interesting choice too, because while he's been at the Boston Group, his his expertise has been in the area of organizational change, which I think everybody agrees is something that IRS is desperately needing. He also is focusing on IT and modernization, so he seems to have a a good background on the problems that IRS is facing. Now, whether he can make those changes quickly and move forward is another question. We don't also know how many other retirements have there been at IRS. We know Carol Campbell left. Uh, the return prepare office director retired at the end of October. I don't know if there are any others that have retired, but he's going to be coming into um, a situation where he's going to have to make some good decisions quickly to, to get things moving, because as everyone on this call knows, it's been stopped for quite a long time. Absolutely. And I think everybody's rooting for him. It's going to be, um, it's going to be, um, you know, he's, he's going to have his hands full when he gets this job. Lots to do. Um, and then what's going on with the 80 billion? I'll just quickly say, so Republicans have made this a campaign issue and have said day one, they want to vote to rescind the money. Of course, with the House, with the Senate being Democratic, the White House being Democratic, that's not going to actually, you know, go into effect. Um, but it'll be inter interesting to see with the smaller majorities if that's still kind of their day one plan, or if the rhetoric will will die down a little. Um, but Republicans have been critical of the eighty billion. But but they'll also say, but yeah, we agree. Like if you ask them about customer service, phones, and stuff, they'll agree that that needs to be improved. Um, but they criticize the, you know, the idea of, of additional audits. Well, you know, um, we've got our priorities on this that NAEA has circulated, and this is one of the areas where we're going to be talking with members, our members, particularly before the fly-in, to get educated about what the priorities are, overhauling CAF, prioritizing the PPS and communication, uh, expanding electronic filing in all categories, speeding up compliance operations and reform that's desperately needed in hiring and training. So we'll be um, working with the members a lot in the months ahead to get ready for the fly-in, to get them prepped. People get pay attention so that they know the messaging that we need to put forth when we get up there on the Hill in May. And, and just so folks know, we have been very engaged. NAEA sent a letter um, well, we've sent two letters. The first one went to the IRS um, at the end of August when this was passed that laid out our priorities for the 80 billion. We recently sent a letter to the Ways and Means and Finance Committee leaders um, laying out, they asked for our sort of input on what should be done. So we laid that out, also sent that to IRS. And then um, Meg and I attended a meeting with the acting uh, commissioner and others last week where we talked about those priorities and they they had a lot of folks in there high level folks taking notes and so um we have not been shy about sharing you know NAEA's perspective um so let me see how many more slides i got here i know we don't have a ton of time so i'm going to go through quickly congressional leadership Lots of drama going on. We'll see what if Nancy Pelosi decides she wants to stay a, a, a few more years or, or, or retire. I think it's likely she could retire. We'll see what happens with McCarthy. McConnell will likely be the next Republican leader in the Senate, although he's he um, there's a vote today. He's expected to win that. But Rick Scott's given him a hard time. So there'll be some headaches along with that, although he's expected to be the next Republican leader. Finance Committee. Um, it's going to stay the same, uh, which is good because we've worked well with with both both of these members and both of these offices. Um, and uh, of course, the IRS nominee will have to move through uh, Finance Committee, um, Ways and Means Committee. Uh, the PAC has supported all three of these individuals, so I think we'll be in a good position. Whoever gets it, um, but Kevin Brady is retiring. Obviously, if Republicans take the majority, which they're expected to do. Um, then there's going to be a new chairman 
And uh, Vern Buchanan, Jason Smith, and Adrian Smith, uh, these three individuals are all kind of fighting it out. And, and we've been sort of working with all of them. So we'll be in a good position, whoever, whoever wins. Um, and then the next Congress. So oversight from the House. It'll be a slim Republican majority, but they want to do lots of oversight. That could include the IRS funding. So we'll be watching that um, closely. Uh, Democrat side will be a little less hard on the administration because it's going to remain Democratic. And then there's going to be lots of new members, seven new Senate members, over 75 new House members. And so NAEA will be busy introducing ourselves and our issues. And this, uh, the, the fly-in in May will be a big part of this um, because these new members aren't familiar with us, obviously. And so uh, there, there'll be a lot of work to do there. And then I just end it with, you know, as we look towards next Congress, will it be gridlock or compromise? Um, I think we'd probably, most of us would probably bet on gridlock, uh, but hopefully there'll be some progress, some compromise and some progress as well. There's always issues that have to get done, whether it's funding the government or, you know, tax extenders. And so there's always opportunity to find compromise, even when Congress seems too divided and, and um, you know, stuck to get anything done. Um, but with that, I know it's 12.02. I don't want to leave us. I don't want to have us go over. I don't know if there are any questions that came in, Michelle, but. Um, just uh, just a question about our priorities, which I which I posted in the chat. OK, great. Um, well, thank you, Michelle. We had a lot of information to cover. And um, and I think, uh, you know, I hope folks enjoyed it. There'll be more of these and more updates as as things kind of shake out from the elections and, and the leadership races and as we enter the, the new Congress. As we um, as we complete our contractual requirements with the hotel, we'll be pulling, finishing up our, our, our um, speakers and panels for the, for the fly-in. More information coming, probably not until later in December, early in the year as we get speakers lined up, but just know that it's going to be really exciting and fun. And we hope that you will all plan to join us in DC. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for their participation and the interest in NAEA's government relations work. This concludes today's program. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thanks everyone. Have a great day. Bye now.